Thank you so much, Brother Ray. He's a dear man and a good friend of this ministry and me personally, so thank you, Brother, for that. And one of the things that I love about Love, Inc. is everything that you just heard from Ray. Uh, ministry is about practicality. It's not about just theory. We are to be people who serve the Lord, and we do that through serving the community. So it's a great ministry to be involved in. Can't say much about Ray, but the ministry is great. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, you can tell we've known each other for a long time, so praise the Lord for that. All right, well, let's pray. And I want to mention also, some of you got the email, hope you saw this. Uh, Bonnie Thornberry's father passed away uh, just the other day, and so they are out of town, Craig and Bonnie, so we want to remember them for sure. So let's pray, and then we'll look into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you already for the gathering that we've had this morning and the joy of fellowship. Thank you for the many activities this weekend and our celebration of our sister Mary Elizabeth going to be with you. And uh, Lord, we do lift up Bonnie and uh, her family right now, Brother Craig, and ask that you just guide their hearts as they experience what they're going through right now. And let them know that our spirits are with them and our love is with them. We thank you that you are able to encompass all these things. And there is no confusion in your mind, no shadow of doubt, uh, according to your plans and what your plans will be. And so we rejoice this morning, uh, knowing that you've given us life and breath this morning to worship you and to exalt you. And so we pray that as we look into your word now for just a few moments, that you would elevate yourself and that you would bring glory to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Would you please stand with me? Stretch your legs for just a second. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 3. We have finished chapters 1 and 2. And so we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 6 today, or at least as far as we, we get until I see your eyes getting sleepy. Okay? All right. So let's pick up in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Praise the Lord. You need to see all right, now you remember, and I'm going to keep repeating this as we go through, the purpose that Matthew has in writing this wonderful, wonderful gospel account is that he is declaring Jesus to be the true king of the Jews. So please keep that in mind as we're doing our study. Now he's done that already in these first couple chapters in several ways. If you're talking to a particular audience, you want to make sure you're tickling their ears with something that's going to have some meaning to them, right? And so what Matthew does is he proclaims the genealogy of Jesus and shows his royalty, uh, his deity, uh, and then even from the Magi's response as they have come to proclaim in this foreign land to Herod the king and all of those surrounding Israel who this Jesus really is, even as a baby. And so his claim to the throne as the true king is even seen there. In Jerusalem's response, we saw, just very briefly, is another way that that happens. And then, of course, through several now fulfilled prophecies, and we'll see this one in uh, these verses today. Now, as we jump into chapter 3, uh, the same theme is there. God is going to use and send one of his heralds, if you will, to announce the coming of the king. And we've not seen any fanfare like this to this point. No one has proclaimed this other than what we've learned about the angel's proclamation to the shepherds. And even Matthew didn't prepare that or didn't proclaim that or write that down. But we know that from the other gospel accounts. But now we have a person who has come to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus. Now just a little bit of background, I think it's important for us to understand the purpose of a herald in the days that this was written. A herald was to do just what we know, and that is to announce the coming of a monarch. It was a literal person who would go 
into the byways and the highways of the place that the monarch was about to appear and literally do two things. One would send his entourage in front of him and cleaning up the road. And so the litter was removed, the potholes would be filled, uh, the way would be literally, in a sense, paved for the monarch to be coming through. But also what they would be doing was be, would be to announce verbally the coming of the king or the monarch, the special person, whenever they were to come. And so Job, uh, the job of the herald was really twofold. And this is what I want you to remember. To proclaim and to prepare. Okay, proclaim and prepare. So you need to remember those two functions because the text really centers around those two truths. And that's exactly what John was called to do. He came very specifically. He was brought into this world for the unique purpose of proclaiming who Christ is and preparing the way for him. In fact, Isaiah prophetically told of John and his coming in Isaiah chapter 40, and that's what you see in verse 3. As we just read, let's just look at it again. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah, the prophet, hundreds of years before Christ would come. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So you just kind of picture that heralding idea of this proclaimer going into Jerusalem now and saying, the king is here, the king is here. And that was his purpose. Now... <clears throat> The title today is the message, The Proclaimer and the Preparer of God's Coming Kingdom. So let's just back up just for a moment and get our minds wrapped around some of the context of who John is, because that becomes very important as we, if we're going to understand the message here. We learn the most about John from Luke's account, not Matthew's account. Luke actually goes into greater detail in Luke chapter 1. For those of you that are Bible students, you know that John's father was a man by the name of Zacharias. He was a temple priest in the, from the, uh, the workers of the, uh, the temple there. His mother was Elizabeth, who was a cousin to Mary. Very well, very uh, clear information given to us about her. Both of them were righteous people, we're told. Meaning that they were morally right, they were upstanding in who they were, they were just. They were honorable. They were people who were true followers of God. But they had one big problem in a human sense, and that was they had no children. And you can imagine that that was a burden on their hearts, and we're told there in the Gospel account that one day Zacharias was performing his duties in the temple as it would become his turn to go in. There were lots of priests, and they would take cycles of turns, and it came down to Zacharias' turn to go into the temple to perform his duties in worship of the Lord. And while he's there, an angel of the Lord appears to him, saying to him, Elizabeth is going to have a son. And this is what you're going to call him. You will call his name John. And by the way, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And you can see all of that in Luke chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. Now John's name means Jehovah or Yahweh is gracious. That's really very important because it tells us that the Lord has great purpose in everything that he does. Now, up to this point, historically, God had been silent. You remember, for 400 years. We call that the intertestamental period, or the time between the ending of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And God was completely silent. There were no prophecies. There were no words from the Lord. All was quiet until this announcement of John coming onto the scene as well as Jesus. Now John would precede Jesus' birth by a few months. And so Zacharias here, according to Luke, is in the temple, and this is the message that he gets from him. The problem was, again, if we know the story, Zacharias doubted the angel's message. That's not a good thing to do. So everybody just put that in your memory banks. When the angel appears up, appears to tell you something, don't doubt what he's telling you, okay? Now, I'm just being silly here. God doesn't need to do that anymore. We have the completion of His Word. But this was before all of that, and so God was doing an amazing thing here. The reason Zechariah doubted was because he and his wife were both barren, if you will. Elizabeth was not able to conceive. She was past the childbearing years of sorts. And so this was a crazy thing to hear. And so you can imagine what his thoughts must have been like. Now, because of Zacharias' unbelief, the angel strikes him, so to speak, with the inability to speak. 
God literally closes his mouth. Now, he can hear, he can see, but he is unable to speak until the child is born. And then John realizes, yes, this is, of course, of the Lord, and God opens his mouth once again. A great miracle, no doubt about it. I want us to understand that John's conception is truly a miracle, but it was not miraculous. Okay, so I want you to understand that Jesus' birth was miraculous. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In this case, Zacharias and Elizabeth uh, were um, the parents of John by natural means. And so it was a miracle of what God did because uh, Elizabeth was not able to have children, but yet it was not miraculous in the same sense. Now, as for John, according to the text that you see there, he was called the Baptist. Now, most people like to say, yeah, that's because he was the chief guy among the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. And uh, that's not the case because there was no First Baptist Church in Jerusalem at the time. Okay, just so you know that. Um, and I say that kind of jokingly, but some people may wonder about that. Uh, but the real purpose of calling him John the Baptist is because baptizing was critical for the identification into Judaism. It was a common practice of people coming out of a pagan life, in this case, more than likely the Gentiles, which is just another name for the non-Jew, was coming into a life of faith in Judaism. And so one of the ways that they would show that, coming into a life of faith in Judaism, was to baptize people. And so that's what John was doing. Now the term proselytizing is a word that we think about sometimes when we're talking about bringing a person from uh, whether it be Maple Grove or a church uh, anywhere else in town into that particular church. Well, that's true in a sense, but the real meaning of the word proselytizing is to bring someone into the Jewish faith. And so if you just put that in your memory banks too, that will help you in your conversations. Now they understood these people that John was baptizing understood that they had to repent. I'll talk about that more in just a minute. They had to confess and turn from their sins. Baptism becomes a picture of that inward reality. And it's been a while since we've had a baptism here, I'm sad to say. And I've been praying for a long time that God would regularly provide baptisms for us. Not for our sake, but just because we want to see the kingdom of God grow. But baptism becomes a beautiful and unbelievable, amazing picture of the inward transformation of the heart. It's the person literally saying, without words, I have trusted Christ as my Lord and my Master. I see Him and believe Him to be the God of all things, the Redeemer of my souls. And as He was buried, because He was dead and rose again, so the baptismal waters pictures that death. And so a person will be laid under the water and then being brought up to show that one day they also will be taken into eternal life. Now this was not something new, okay, but unfortunately there were people in John's day and even in our day that didn't allow this to really go very deep in their hearts. In fact, many of these same people that John was baptizing here in this scene are people that would eventually turn against him. And John would lose much of his popularity as if he was just the next exciting thing on the block. Okay, so it's not really much different from our culture today. You know, it doesn't take much for people to abandon something just because it was the most exciting thing. The problem is, if there's really no heart change in a spiritual sense, there isn't going to be any change. So these people, as we see in the rest of the scriptures, will be those that, even like with Jesus, will come to him for a certain period of time. But when things get a little bit challenging, they end up going a different direction. And that's the inherent danger for all of us. If I could just put out a little flag of warning here of following the next or the latest exciting person or the next exciting thing on the block. We have to be extremely careful about this because our emotions can lie to us. Is that true? I mean, emotions are good things. We've talked many times about this, but emotions are given to us by God, but our emotions can very much lie to us. There are many, many, many people that get off on the wrong path in life because they're so engrossed in their emotional state and the way they feel about things internally. You'll know, hear people even say it in their conversations. Well, I did this and felt I needed to do that because of just that. I feel that this is the right thing to do. 
But emotions will definitely lie to us, and they'll make us think all kinds of things, even cause us to make strange decisions. So, beloved, listen, we have to be very wise in the way that we approach the things in this life, especially about our feelings and how our feelings make us feel about specific things. Some examples from the scripture are uh, great for us as we think about the life of Job. Just follow with me for just a second. You remember the story of Job? Job lost everything. He was a righteous man. He was the most righteous man of the day. But he lost everything in just a matter of hours, literally. His family members, he lost servants, he lost his livestock, his livelihood. But he didn't let that affect his relationship with the Lord. Because Job was not a man who got overwhelmed by his emotional state. He could have easily. He could have very much said, I'm not going to follow this God anymore. In fact, that's what his wife told him to do, you remember? Just curse God and die. That's an emotional response. But God hasn't called us to live through emotional responses. People do it all the time. I'll do this or that because, again, I feel this way. Job said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. This was right after all of these terrible events had happened. And notice what he says, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is a profound statement, a profound truth where a man could go through what he did and what he experienced and be able to, in the midst of it all, say, you know what? The Lord is sovereign over life. He's sovereign over the good and He's sovereign over the bad, at least what appeared to be bad to me. But blessed be His name because He is the King and He is the supreme God of all things. In other words, very simply, Job was able to filter his feelings through his theology. Now, theology is just that big buzzword that in, in scriptural life we talk about to reference what we believe about God. Job was able to take his feelings and filter them through his theology or his doctrine, the teachings that he understood God to be given to him. And through doing that, he was able to clarify what was really accurate. Again, he could have easily gotten lost in the emotions of all of his decisions and what he was experiencing, but he didn't do that. And I think it's because Job knew three different things theologically that kept him following the truth of God and kept his emotions in check. Number one, as I've already said, he knew that the truth, that he knew the truth that God was sovereign. God is over the affairs of all mankind. Just last night, I wasn't saying these words, but in my mind were these very truths. As we as believers of the church were sitting with uh, the folks that were here, we don't know whether they were true believers or not. We don't know enough about their lives. But what a joy to be able to stand up and share a testimony of a lady like Mary Elizabeth who give, gave very clear evidence of her salvation, who was not a woman who gave in to the emotional state that she was experiencing. Now, many of you don't know this, but Mary Elizabeth was suffering from a non-cirrhosis of the liver, excuse me, non-alcoholic cirrhosis of the liver. And that was what eventually took her life. But she was not a woman to complain about God and why God had done all this. I'm sure she had her weak moments. But she was a woman who gave example that we were able to share with the rest of the folks here of what we saw in her life. And Mary, uh, Rosemary did a wonderful job, as many of you did, several of you did, about sharing what you felt about Mary Elizabeth and how God is sovereign over the affairs of our lives. And we don't need to listen to the emotional state that we find ourselves in and get distracted and distraught on every little whim that comes along. I think Job understood that. I think, secondly, he knew that God is just. God is righteous. God makes no mistakes in what he does. In fact, in verse 22 of Job 1, again, right after this event, through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Nor did he blame God. You know, it's one thing to love God when things are going well. It's one thing to praise God when things are going well. But it's quite another when things start going south a little bit, isn't it? When we really get stricken by something that we can't explain. And we look and wonder why God isn't fixing it. But when we understand true and correct theology of who God really is, we understand that He is just, He is sovereign. And thirdly, we know that God is good. 
Everything that God does is good. Job understood that. And I know that because of what he says in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, Job said, yet will I put my hope in him. And when was the last time you were able to say that? Even if the Lord kills me through what I'm experiencing right now, my hope is in him. My hope is in him. Folks, listen. That is faith in the true God. That's reality of who God really is. Listen, if you don't believe these fundamental truths, the truths about not getting lost in our emotional states, not letting our emotions dictate to us, if we'll understand that and believe in what the Scriptures teach us about who God is, we will be fine. We'll struggle, but we'll be fine. If we don't adhere clearly to the teachings of God's Word, we will surely be food for Satan. Certainly. And I can't emphasize that enough. Now, I'm, I'm belaboring this point a little bit because I know my own emotions. And I know how many times emotions affect you. I live with you. I know what life is like. And it is so easy to make your decisions about life based on your emotions. And you know who is often the first one to get the boot? It's God. It's the church. Often when we're in a difficult situation or a challenging situation, our emotions are so strongly in, against us or directing us or pushing us and Satan working in the background of all of that to manipulate us, the first thing to go are the things that are the truth. And we have to be so cautious of that. If we want to have a sound mind, if we want to make clear decisions in this life, then our doctrine is critically important. This is why we spend so much time on this. I know it gets boring sometimes reading through the text and hearing people talk about it in the Sunday school classes and all this kind of stuff. But the reason that we spend so much time dealing with every word of the text is because of this right here. If we are not clearly certain about what the Lord has taught us, we will get distracted in all kinds of directions. And we're watching a society unfold just like that. Our nation that was founded upon biblical principles, has so far gotten off the truth of doctrine and sound theology that we make some really weird decisions now, really strange things, that God could rectify and will rectify if people will turn their hearts back to Him. So we don't ever want the church, us, to be victims of anything like that, right? Amen? Everybody just shake their head, just in agreement. And I'm the dictator here, and you just do as I say. And I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Those of you who are laughing, laugh loudly so our guests won't think that I'm serious about that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> I can always depend on Brother Chuck. Thanks, Doc. All right, so back to the text now. John's main function now, you just again remember, is to proclaim and to prepare the way of the king, to make ready God's people for their true king. Now by this time, according to the historical records that we have, John and Jesus are probably somewhere in their late 20s, and so we've skipped over quite a few years of their lives. We've had the 400 years of silence. There's not been any proclamation other than what we have now. But Jesus is just about to begin his official public ministry. Now John, like Jesus, is unique in Scripture because there's nothing told us about his early childhood years. We don't know anything about what John's life was like in his upbringing, but what we do understand is that he was from a priestly line. I've already made reference to that, and you see that pretty clearly. So it would be right for him, just in a, even a genealogical sense himself, to proclaim God. He was of the priesthood. He was of that service and God's word and take advantage of all of that. But his method was very out of the ordinary. I mean, this guy was very unorthodox. And I don't have a lot of time to go into all that. We'll talk about that next time, about all of those who are coming against him that the text brings up. His method was to wear not the customary garb of the priesthood, but as you read in the text there, he was wearing a very strange kind of clothing which was made up of camel's hair and a leather belt. That's weird. Okay? In the day... That was weird. That's not what the Pharisees and the Sadducees wore. Again, we'll talk about those groups next time. 
He didn't minister in the temple, which is where you're supposed to minister. But John ministered in the wilderness. He was that weird guy that lived out on the mountain somewhere that people just made funny jokes about. But yet, fascinatingly, we find out that he was God's man. He ate strange foods, locusts. Now, to us, forgive us if you're from another nation, and that's a delicacy for you. For us, locusts are not high on our delicacy list. Okay. Um, at least not on mine. Um, praise the Lord for locusts. Um, I don't really want to eat them right now, but that's what John spent his time on. The wild honey, I could deal with that. Um, but this is what he survived on. I suppose anybody that knew John would say, you know, that guy, he's just really out of touch. He, let's just call it what it is. He's strange, weird, fanatical in his own way. Now, you're going to understand that better when we get to the Pharisees again because they also were very fanatical in the wrong way. Just different. Again, out of touch with the current culture. And that's very important to culture, isn't it? I mean, people like people that are very much involved in the current culture. We don't feel weird when we talk to somebody that looks okay, sounds okay, dresses okay, lives okay, because we've built this box that people should fit into. But you know, some of the strangest people, according to culture, have been the, one, been the ones that God has used the most. And that's certainly the case with John here. And this was okay for John, because John knew the fundamental truth of who God is. He understood that faithfulness to God and His truth is more critical and more important than anything that the culture thinks. Listen to that. Faithfulness to God's truth is what's critical so much more so than what the culture thinks. In other words, he didn't care about the cultural trends. He didn't sit down at night and check out the television or the news feeds didn't look at the Twitter accounts, didn't look at Instagram, didn't check out those things to see what the latest clothing styles were. He was weird. I mean, this John was a strange guy. He didn't care about what people thought. He didn't need the accolades of the crowd to recognize him. Do you see how emotions push us in those ways? He didn't try to accommodate the culture by being the coolest, the hippest. It didn't matter to John. He didn't need to be the trendiest. He didn't need to use special effects, the light show, the fog machines. He didn't need to use all that stuff to get people to pay attention to him. But what he did do was simply give his life for the truth. That was John. He believed in the truth of God and was more committed to the truth of God's word even than his own life. How many people have you ever met in this world that are so engrossed in the culture that they would give their life for the culture? I don't know of anybody. Because as soon as the next cultural trend comes along, they're going to jump ship and go to that. Because they don't understand the foundation of everything that's really true. Which again is the Word of God. He knew who Jesus was. In fact, we're told in John 1 verse 29, after this event that John records that we're reading in Matthew, this is what John says, or that we're told, the next day he, that's John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and said to the crowd, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John wasn't crazy, was he? John knew. But John was just simply different. So the point is, listen, if you're going to live outside of the culture, and you're going to survive that way, you've got to know who Jesus is. I mean, you really got to know who the Lord and Master is if you're going to push off the cultural trends of this world and live for Christ. And I'm not talking about living with camel hair on. I mean, God may call you to do that. And by the way, can I just say this? And I don't know all about who these people are, but I was just driving, went to see Dad in Lynchburg the other day, and I was driving in a part of town where there's a guy who has, and has for years, had all of this <laughs> religious paraphernalia about Jesus saving and uh, these messages of Christ, I don't know anything about him, but I thought about this text, and I thought about John the Baptist, and I wondered how many people drive by and look at those signs and think, that guy's a real weirdo. But you know what he is doing? He's proclaiming the truth. 
You see some people that are walking along the streets and they're carrying a cross. And again, listen to me. I'm not promoting these people, but I am saying to us, sometimes God does some very unique things that are very counter to the culture in order to get our attention. John was that guy. If we're going to live counter to the culture, we better know who Jesus is. We better be able to proclaim like John, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If we don't have that settled in our hearts, we will again fall victim for everything. Because when you believe who He truly is, you also will give your life for Him. I really believe this is the problem with Christianity today. The church has weakened in a lot of ways because people don't really believe who Jesus is. If we really believe in who Jesus is, we also would be willing to give our lives for who Jesus is. Listen, there are people in this world, even right now, who are laying their necks on the chopping block because they believe in who Jesus is. Now, we don't like to think about that a lot. We don't like to read those news reports. But just pick up some of those news reports and look at the people who are literally giving their lives for Christ. I'm talking about dear brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who love Jesus and stand against the cultural trends, whatever they may be, and are willing to give their life here on this earth for a better life. This was John. And eventually John will lose his life. He will be beheaded. Jesus will lose his life. The disciples will lose their lives because of one reason. They were so dumb. They believed. They were not guided by their emotions. They were dedicated to the truth of who Christ is. God come in the flesh. The redeemer of all mankind. The rescuer of our souls. The one who has come to show us true eternal life. Folks, listen. He's the one we should be giving our lives to. I'm saddened, I just have to tell you this, I'm saddened when I find that the church is always cut first. When there are the events of life and the situations of life that are occurring, it seems to me, and I hope I'm wrong about this, but it seems to me that it's the church that is the first thing cut. Folks, listen, I'm not here to judge, that's not my calling. But I am a spiritual God, I am an authoritative spiritual person by the hand of the Lord. And I'm saying to all of us is that the church should not be the first thing cut in life. Why? Because Jesus is the King. And that's exactly what John is getting ready to proclaim here. He is the supreme leader of all the universe. In fact, John understood this so well. Jesus said of John in Matthew 11, we'll get to this at some point in our life, Truly I say to you, this is Jesus, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. That's Jesus saying that about John the Baptist. This weirdo wearing camel's hair and a leather belt and eating locusts and wild honey out in the wilderness. Jesus himself, the Lord of glory, says, you want to see somebody who's great? In fact, not greater than, he, greater than no one greater than him in the entire world at the time and before? was John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Let me read that again. John the Baptist is the greatest, but listen to what Jesus says. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him, or greater than he. What does Jesus mean? That's a strange statement. What's he talking about? What was it that made him great? Well, again, John had one purpose, one objective, to proclaim Christ, to prepare the hearts. In fact, one commentator put it this way about John. He was willing, he was calling people away from the system. John was calling them away from their hypocrisy of their religiosity, away from their phoniness of their temple worship, away from all the luxury and the involvement in the system and calling them out to a desolate spot where they could begin to focus on the desolate, arid qualities of their own hearts. He wanted them away where they were freer to think and hear and forget, where they didn't have the influences of all those things around them, and all the things that they had become so comfortable with, they had to leave the system. 
They had to leave the city of Jerusalem. They had to leave the temple. They had to go way out in desolation. Why? Because God knows that it's in the middle of the everyday life that Christ is often missed. When we get wrapped up in our ideologies of life, it is when we miss Jesus because we're so enamored with the world. And God knows that. And so God used John to call the people out from their system to hear from him where there was no distraction. Where Jesus wouldn't just be a passing thought or a Sunday morning thing, but he would be the focus of their minds. And there's great value in that, beloved. There's great value in turning the radio off. There's great value in turning the television off. There's great value in removing yourself from the distractions of the day in order to hear from the Lord, putting yourself in a calm place so you're not distracted from His voice. And listen, it is easy to get distracted. Even Elijah, the greatest of prophets, got distracted. We're told of the life that he had in this amazing encounter that he had with God over the prophets of Baal. You remember that in 1 Kings? God comes down and consumes Elijah's offering. All the prophets of Baal who are Satan worshipers are killed. And in the very next chapter, Jezebel, this ungodly woman, hears about it all because the priests have all been killed. And she wants his life. And Elijah gets fearful, and he runs away from her and into the wilderness, afraid. And while he's running for his life, he has an encounter with God. And listen to this, though. This is the part that I wanted you to hear. You know the story, but listen to this part. Behold, the Lord was passing by as Elijah's out in the wilderness, running from God. And a great strong wind was rendering the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. And the world would say, there's God. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Don't you love that? The Lord just whispers to Elijah, Hey, what are you doing here? You see that picture? Elijah is this great servant of the Lord and he's seen these incredible things by God, but he allowed himself to get so distracted and caught up in the situation that he failed to be the true proclaimer that he needed to be. And so God sends him out into the wilderness under his own fearful emotions and when he's out there, God gets his attention by whispering in his ear. Listen, the world shouts at us every single day. Buy this. You need this. Come over here. Go over there. Do this. Do that. You've got to have it. Oh my gosh. If you miss this, you're outside of the cultural trend. And you're a freak. That's what the world says. And so God says what we need is to regularly pull away from all of that so that we can hear the still small voice of the King Himself guiding us and leading us. Our emotions get involved. We get all ramped up, right? Face gets red. We get all irritated. We start telling everybody what to do, what's wrong with them. And then we start getting fearful inside and controlling ourselves in weird ways. What we need to do is just settle our hearts and trust in the King of Kings. That was John. That was Elijah. But I want to point your attention to this latter part of the verse that I read a second ago. Jesus said, this is in Matthew 11, verse 11. Of all those great qualities of John, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Least in the kingdom. Greater than John. In other words, John was obedient to all God had called him to do. There's no question about that. Yet what God is saying here, beloved, is that those of us who have the fulfilled word of God, that book sitting in your lap, or that book that you haven't pulled out of the pew rack yet, that book that's on your phone, we call the Bible. That's the fulfilled Word of God. God says those who have that are considered even greater than John. Now think about this. Those who have the fulfilled Word of the Lord are considered greater even than John. Why? Because John only saw a partial fulfillment of what the Lord had planned at that point. 
John only had a token of what God was going to do. But you and I have the full atoning message of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have it all. We have it all. So the Lord is saying, listen, we know the beginning from the end. We know the transforming power of the Lord. We have the experiences of the Lord. We watch the Lord do amazing things. And so Jesus is saying in this chapter, listen, there will be those who come after John who will be even far greater. And they will be considered least in the kingdom, meaning that's not a uh, derogatory statement. That's a compliment. You and me is who he's talking about. We have a greater view from God than even John the Baptist had. Why? Because we have been given the fulfillment of all the prophecies. We have the completion of everything that Christ came to do. We know that He is coming back. Amen? Amen. We know that He's coming to settle the score with Satan. We've already looked at all of that in our study in Revelation. He's coming back. And He's given us that truth. John and the prophets before him had only the foretelling of it. They didn't see the completion of it all, but we've been given the very completion of it all. And so Jesus is talking about us in that. We are even greater than John. You say, well, what does that mean? I mean, what does that mean practically? It means we've been given the full revelation of who He is. And listen, here's those two words I wanted you to remember. We are then the proclaimers of Christ. And we are the preparers of Christ's coming. The second time. John was the proclaimer and the preparer of his first coming. But the church, you and me, we are the proclaimers. We are the heralds. We are the ones that are making his way clear. Why? Because he's coming again. Do you see that? So that's why Jesus could say in Matthew's Gospel, hey, you want to know who's greater than John? It's those who are in my church who are going to be the proclaimers and the preparers of my second coming. <coughs> who is that? That's you and me. That's every person who proclaims the truth of who Christ is and is settled that Jesus is their Lord and Master. Can I just ask the question? How are you doing in proclaiming and preparing the coming of Christ? John wore camel's hair and leather belt and ate locusts and wild honey to remove the culture away from the confusing scenarios of Satan into the wilderness so that the people would see Christ and Christ alone when he would behold him in their presence. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. But we are greater. We are greater because we have been given the message that Christ is coming again. And we are to be the proclaimers. We are to be the preparers of His entrance. We don't know when that's going to be. But if you truly believe theology, if you believe doctrine, if you believe truly who Christ is, then you will be a proclaimer. You will not be afraid to look for opportunities to share Jesus. I didn't say you wouldn't be intimidated. I didn't say that your flesh wouldn't try to get your emotions all stirred up. But when we know the truth, we become the heralds. How are we doing? It's a very interesting question. Isn't it? I think I'm going to leave us with that right there. Except to say now, John's message is this. Look at verse 2. One simple message. And we'll pick up here next time. One simple message. He didn't have commentary after commentary after commentary, which is not bad. I praise the Lord for commentaries. But John had one message. Look at it. Repent. Repent. That was his message. Repent. Now let me just define that for us for just a minute because I think this is important. It means turn around. It means turn around. Not just in a physical sense. You've often seen this picture. We're going this way. We encounter the truth and then we turn ourselves. It's not just a physical turning, but it's a turning of the mind. It's a turning of the mind and the will. I'm changing from what's wrong to what's right. Not just in a physical sense, but I'm changing my thinking process from wrong thinking to right thinking. And that's determined by the Word of God. 
We're changing from sin to righteousness, to living a life of righteousness from old ways to new ways. In other words, the meaning of this is you need to be converted. That's what John was proclaiming. Repent. In other words, if we could change the phrase, he's saying be converted. Or we could use just the one word, convert, convert, convert. But what's he talking about converting to? You need to give up a life of sin and follow Christ. Now that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. But he's the perfect one. Repent. Because you need to be the proclaimers of his righteousness. The preparers of his way to come. But you're not going to be able to do that if you first don't convert in your heart and your soul. You're going this way. You need to turn. Why do we need to do that? Notice what John says in verse 2. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. Now that's a euphemism. Because Matthew is writing to Hebrews. And so the Hebrews didn't want to use God in their sentences. And so in the other Gospels you see the kingdom of God is at hand. But Matthew is trying to be sensitive here. It's the only time it's used in the Gospel of Matthew. But it's a clear and straightforward message. You need to be converted in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Why? Because the King is here. He is here. But listen, no one wants Jesus unless they see who He is and understand the reason why they need to be converted. Like Moses. Hebrews 11, we're told, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. That's the key. He saw, he understood, he converted his heart, and I should say, understand what I'm saying here, God did the work in his heart, but Moses met God there in his mind, and he agreed with what God was saying to him. He accepted who God is. And he gave up all the pleasures of Egypt. The sinfulness of Egypt. It was great pleasure. Because sin is pleasurable, right? For who God is. Moses becomes a great example. Seeing Jesus for who he is. I remember my conversion. Do you remember yours? I hope you do. I'm not just talking about just the time you changed your mind, but I'm talking about your conversion. When you said, Jesus, I see now who you are, and I want you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to rescue me from the damnation of my soul. Pay the penalty of my sin for me out of your kind grace and, grace and, grace and, and kindness. Not because of anything I did, or anything because of what you did, but simply because of who I met. The day I met Jesus, my life changed. And many of you have the same testimony. We see who Jesus is. And when you see Jesus for who He is, beloved, you will change. So I don't want to scare you. It's a good thing. But for those of you who have never truly met Jesus, when you meet Him truly and your heart is confirmed who He is, you will change. You will change. You say, oh great, I'm going to start wearing camel hair. And I want to have to start eating locusts and wild honey? Well, I'm going to say no. God may say something else. I don't know what God's going to do. But what I can say is that you're going to be greatly blessed. Okay? Nicodemus was one of the greatest examples of that. Of that change. He was a Jewish leader. He was a Pharisee. He recognized who Jesus was. And he comes to him by night. Because he's afraid. To really come in the daytime for fear of who might see him coming. And he has this incredible encounter with Jesus. And Jesus just interrupts him and says, listen Nicodemus, here's what you need. Here's what you need. Just mark it down. Get your notebook out. I'm going to give you what you need. You need to be converted. You need to change. Here's the words. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. He cannot see it. Listen. What's Jesus saying? He's saying the same thing to every one of us. Unless your eyes are opened, you will not see me for who I am. And that's the testimony of the world, isn't it? 
The world says, oh yeah, I hear about Jesus, but he was just a good man. He was just one of those prophets. Or they deny him completely. Why do they do that? Because of exactly what Jesus is saying here. Unless you see me for who I am, or you are born again, your spirit is renewed by my power, Jesus would say, you will not be able to see me for who I am. I am the kingdom of God. I am the king. But you will not be able to see. You ever try to talk to somebody that doesn't really want to hear what you have to say? It's because they don't see God has not opened their heart to see. That's part of our responsibility. All right, I've gone way farther than I wanted to this morning, but let's just leave those thoughts in our minds. Listen, if you hear nothing else right now, understand, proclaimers and preparers. That's the message of God. We are to be the proclaimers and we are to be the preparers. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? No, the kingdom of God is coming again. Christ is coming again. And He will make all things right. The question will be, how will He find you? Will He be able to say, here is one of my faithful servants doing my work? Or will He find His church, the people who proclaim Him, to be caught up in the things of this world far more than they're caught up in Him? You understand the picture? It's very clear very sober. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, this morning, as often, we seem to hear from the pulpit the message of John the Baptist, who comes across as a man who was not a, a jokester or uh, a guy who just did a job, but a man who was fully committed to the depths of his soul that was miraculously given not because he was a miracle in the sense that Jesus was but because he was a man that you had put your spirit in to proclaim the coming of Christ. And Lord, as we hear Jesus' words this morning, we are awakened, reminded, stirred to accept the fact that the church was given the mandate to be similar to John the Baptist in proclaiming your second coming. Lord, thank you for the simple message of your servant. It's our prayer this morning that not only would our hearts be adjusted and fixated again on who you are, but that if there is any soul here today who's never heard these words or really doesn't understand what we're talking about here from your word, I pray that in your way that you would make it clear Lord, that you would prompt their minds with questions <coughs> and that you would bring a deep-seated conviction to their souls, not because we want them to be burdened with problems, but because it's through those convictions that we find our souls turning to you and finding the relief for eternity that we really need. Lord, thank you for the convicting work of your Spirit. And we ask you to open our hearts to the Again, reawakening in the convicting power of your word that we might be a church that not just enjoys the fellowship of one another, but that we understand the job that we've been called to do, to proclaim the excellencies of who you are so that the world might be rescued. Lord, may we, in a sense, stand out from the culture, not to be freakish or so strange that the world won't listen, but may we be different in the sense that we have a proclamation of love, a proclamation of truth, so that the world will know that you are God and that you love them and you've come to rescue them. Thank you, Father, that you require nothing from us, no money, no clothing, no houses. What you require is a converted heart. And Lord, we ask you to do your work powerfully because we know that when people accept you for who you are, they will be changed and they will forever be in your presence and you will be glorified. Lord, take this time, we pray, and use it for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.